next panel looks at the question, can AI help everyone enjoy culture as a global public good? All right, so hello again. Um, I realized I didn't introduce myself at the very beginning, so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Kuzina, and I'm the Director of Policy and Open Culture at Creative Commons, and I'm really happy to be moderating panel two on um, culture as a public good and what is the AI's role in all of this. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here on this panel with excellent speakers, and I say this from experience, I've written speaking, it's truly wonderful to have you on this panel. Um, here is Yasin Jernait from Hugs in Space, um, and Yasin is machine learning and society lead at Hugs in Space working on machine learning systems governance at the intersection of regulatory and technical tools. Their work to date is focused on natural language processing and multimodal and data curation, documentation, and governance. And most recently as co-organizer and data area chair for the Big Science Workshop on Large Language Models. It's really nice to have you here. Um, next is uh, Stacy Lampanish. She's a um, law professor at Western New England University School of Law. She specializes in intellectual property law, especially how copyright and trademark law intersect with digital creativity. She's a member of the legal committee on the Organization for Transformative Works, a nonprofit dedicated to providing access to and preserving the history of fan works and fan culture. Uh, in its myriad forms, and among other things, the OCW runs the Archive of Our Own, which is a website with over 6 million registered users, users hosting almost 12 million works of fan fiction. And to the my extreme left is Nicholas Garcia from Public Knowledge, which is Public Council, oh sorry, Policy Council at Public Knowledge, that's the DC-based public interest organization that promotes freedom of expression, an open internet, and affordable access to creative tools and works. And Nicholas works at Public Knowledge is focused on emerging technologies, intellectual property, and closing the digital divide. So what brings us together on this panel today is that um, last year in September, UNESCO, which is the United Nations Organization for Education, Science, and Culture, adopted the Mondial declaration in Mexico City, and that declaration for the first time elevated culture as a global public good. It also paved the way for culture to be recognized as a sustainable development goal in and of itself. Currently, it's not a specific goal out of the 71, it's kind of transversal, but there are there is a huge movement to make culture a sustainable development goal in and of itself. And so um, in looking at how AI interacts with this, um, we've seen efforts that could demonstrate that AI could reduce the barriers for everyone to be able to enjoy culture as a global public good. But at the same time, there's a risk, and we've heard this already a few times this morning, that it could perpetuate cultural power imbalances. So, I'm hoping to hear from different perspectives on how to get this right and how AI could concretely support uh, culture as a global public good. Um, and maybe just to get just beyond definition, what is a global public good? Well, a public good is a good that you know benefits all members of society and society as a whole, but needs to be publicly supported in order to be so I'll hand over to each of the panelists for your opening remarks, and then we'll jump into questions, starting with Yasin. Sure. So I'm going to start giving a bit more of an introduction of uh, recent projects that are relevant to those questions. Um, so High in Face is uh, mostly a platform, so there's a role in uh, moderating and curating uh, AI systems that people are sharing, seeing how we can shift things that way, offering tools that help people document them and see where they come from. There were some comments before about knowing what's the provenance, who has been annotating, who is representing in the data. Uh, and we've also been co-organizing uh, large efforts to help create AI systems in a way that's more, that hinges on consent and on governance a little bit more. And uh, so one of those examples was the Big Science Project, uh, very imaginative, uh, a very original name. Um, and the idea there is we brought together uh, over 1,000 researchers on training one large language model. So it was after GPT-3 was released, 
right, which is cool technology. This can be cool technology, but there are some issues we want to address with respect to consent, with respect to data curation, with respect to governance, and with interacting with current and upcoming regulations. So a couple of the choices that we made there were, for example, in balancing access and transparency and security. So we wanted a model that was multilingual, which wasn't the thing that existed at the time, but we wanted people to be able to control how they were represented. So it meant that uh, we chose a set of languages that we were going to focus in, and then we had a policy that if we were going to represent a language in the training data, we needed to have first speakers of the language be involved in the data creation. And that's a choice that's not obvious to everyone, right? We ended up with a model that didn't have any exposure to German, which is a somewhat high resource language, and people asked, like, why didn't you do that? And we said, because we didn't have German speakers that were able to do the work of checking that the work was done right. Um, so we've been interacting a lot at this intersection of like what's regulation, what's consent, and what's people's ability to control how they're represented. Another project we had was this code that did that for like a code project, doing something like Codex or GitHub, GitHub Copilot. And that was making some choices to train only on uh, content that was very permissively licensed, and then giving people a level of opt-out on top of that. So that's not necessarily a copyright issue, right? Like people have put their data in the web with a license that allows any kind of reuse, but we understand that there's a place to address consent beyond what regulation is currently providing, so we're figuring out how it's going to come in regulation. Um, so all that to say that there are all of those choices, like one of the really big things uh, I think is important to remember about AI is that like, it's not a given, it's not a choice, there's tons of development choices that occur that kind of balance all of these issues. Um, and one thing I like doing is kind of like fighting those narratives of inevitability of saying like this is what AI is, it's like this is what AI is because that's how people have done it so far, uh, but there's a lot we can imagine to give more access and to make it more close for fair use. Hi, um, so I don't really do anything with the tech side of things. Um, I was an English major, so I have no idea about all of that stuff. Um, but I do, I'm an intellectual property lawyer, as you heard at the introduction, and I do a lot of work on behalf of fan creators, and I'm a creative writer myself. Um, I'm not very old, but I feel very old digitally because I feel like I've been through this before now several times, right? That when search engines were, th I will date myself, search engines became a thing when I was in law school, right? And so search engines became this thing and we were going to be able to access all of human information that's not where we ended up. We just put more stuff behind more locked doors and made everything as inaccessible as we could figure out how to do 20 years down the line, right? Um, Facebook also came out while I was in law school, a very eventful law school career. Um, and that was like amazing, right? We were all gonna be connected and we were all gonna talk to each other. And it was a very, very short road from there to the collapse of democracy, right? Like we just didn't end up where we thought we were going to end up with a lot of these. Um, and so I want to be really excited and happy and hopeful about AI, and I'm really nervous that we're just going to go down the same path, right? Um, and I think about my sister recently had this experience, and this is going to seem like it has nothing to do with AI, and in a way it doesn't, but I'm going to link it up, I promise. Um, she wanted to show her children The Sound of Music, which is a movie that we grew up with, and she wants to show her children The Sound of Music, and she could not find a copy of The Sound of Music for her to legally access on any streaming platform. And I was like, gee, when we were kids, you know what we did? We went to Blockbuster and we rented The Sound of Music, right? Like there was no, and was there a cost in having to get in a car and go to Blockbuster? Yeah, obviously. So you would think it would be better for people, like we could just put the movie on digitally and everybody could access these movies. They're not there even if you want to pay for them, right? Like we have literally created all of this scarcity it is the opposite of what I think we thought the internet was gonna bring about, that we would be able to access so much more stuff. Think about how much more difficult it is for libraries to deal with their digital collections because they are coming with all sorts of, of legal boundaries around them that actually don't exist with physical copies. When you buy a copy of a book, you can sell the copy of that book and they can't do anything to you. When you are buying digital music, they're blocking it so you can't do anything else with it, right? So none of this has anything to do with AI. But this is all to sort of just share my perspective that I want AI to be awesome, but I'm really concerned that we're just gonna use it to appropriate culture from people and then render it more inaccessible than it, than it already is. Um, and so that's why I'm so happy we're having these discussions because I want us to sort of be thinking about these things as we move forward. Fantastic. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if it's fantastic. No, but. It's, it's, <laughs> would, what you had to say was fantastic Thank because you. it leads in so well to what I was going to talk about, which is that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about public knowledge um, because we are a DC-based public interest organization that has been fighting for many years for the open internet, for all of the promise and potential that we see in technology for sharing, for openness, um, for having more affordable access to creative works and tools. Um, and what I was hoping to bring to this conversation builds so well on what, what Stacy set up for me, which is talking about how those fights for the open internet, um, fights to close the digital divide, to make internet accessible to everyone, uh, to achieve universal service, fight against digital discrimination that exists um, in terms of how broadband internet is deployed, in terms of how people are able to participate in digital communities, and pushing back against the, the mistakes, frankly, that were made in the like enclosure of the web as we moved from that early promise and potential of the internet into platforms centralizing more and more value for themselves. So um, yeah, what I wanted to talk about was that if uh, we're hoping for AI to be this force for developing culture as a global public good, we need two really big things. The first thing that we need is we need to make sure that AI becomes an accessible technology that everyone is able to enjoy. In the same way that we have seen with the internet, that getting the internet out to people is what is critically important in terms of ensuring that people are equitably represented online, uh, we need to do the same thing with AI. We need to make sure that it's accessible, that people have the ability to literally connect that means solving things like the digital divide that are still a problem, making sure people have access to the internet, to the technology that they need to engage with this. It means making sure that it's affordable, that we don't, right now, a lot of AI products are integrated into things that people already have, but maybe some of those things you need expensive licenses for. Right now, a lot of things are offered for free online in the same way that Google was free and social media was free, and then we started to understand that these things came at a greater and greater cost to us in terms of privacy, in terms of surveillance, and slowly the quality of those things degraded over time too. Um, so we need to ensure that we maintain that affordability, um, both in terms of whether that's actual monetary cost or larger cost to people in society. Um, and we need to boost adoption, which is that people need to understand why this technology is going to benefit them. They need to see that there are real benefits to them in the technology. Um, and the trust needs to be built between people and communities and AI as a technology for them to want to engage with it and view it as something positive and uh, building towards culture. Um, and so the second thing that is related to this that we need is to build systems both culturally and legally uh, that support AI development, data policies, intellectual property, uh, that builds towards that open shared culture that will create that trust for people to adopt and create AI systems that are inclusive and equitable in their, in their data practices and in terms of representing global public culture more, more uh, wholesomely. Uh, so I'll leave it there. So how do we do all of that? <laughs> <laughs> You've given us, I think, wonderful aspirations, I guess, is what are the milestones on the way to, to enabling that kind of access that you imagine and the, the sustainable systems that, would, that will need public support. So um, what are some of the, the pathways towards that? I'll be happy to start since I, since I started the issue. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the things that I do want to address is, like I said, uh, as we start thinking about AI, it's very exciting to be thinking about the, and we should be thinking about the problems and then solution spaces within the AI realm, but it is critically important to begin thinking as well about the fundamental underlying things that we still need to address, like closing the digital divide in places, ensuring that people have access, robust access to an open internet. Um, there are many places, including outside of the United States, where practices like zero rating um, and non-bad, non-net neutral policies exist that ensure that people are pretty limited in what their scope of the internet is. There's countries where people's whole capacity for interacting with the internet is limited to the social media platforms that zero rate themselves in terms of their data plans and things like that. That's not building an open internet or, a, or an open future where people are going to have broad access to promoting global culture through AI because everything's gonna move through these kinds of gatekeepers. So um, both in the United States and outside of it, we need to ensure that we're like laying good foundations in terms of net neutrality, open internet, um, 
cutting down on digital, uh, eliminating digital discrimination and, and uh, redlining in terms of how we distribute internet. Um, all of those fundamental things are gonna go into building like more inclusive data environments for people to begin engaging with AI. So I think that's one thing that we definitely have to keep considering here. And that's something you're going with, with you. Um, yes, but what I was going to say is, like, I absolutely agree with not diverting uh, resources from fights that are already going on and are already important. Uh, at the same time, one of the most frustrating answer to give to the question that mm -hmm. you started with is, it's a very multi-pronged approach. Like, the only way we make progress is if we make progress on all of the fronts together. Mm -hmm. And one of the fronts is doing looking at where uh, AI is changing the game, and where like AI is exacerbating more of the issues that already exist. One of the things that I'm very bullish for uh, towards in that space is uh, more transparency, more disclosure requirements. If we're going to have different discussions about what the systems are doing and what they're not doing, uh, we need to know what they're, how they're functioning. wonderful behavior, the super impressive interactions that you have with the chat GPT or with the code or with whatever else is a reflection of human labor or something that someone has done in the past uh, and that's something that needs to be more in the public eye and understanding exactly where that's coming from. Yeah, I think I think the transparency is is important um, and I, I will say with my lawyer hat on that it's a real challenge because we reward companies not being transparent, um, keeping their algorithms trade secrets and, and things of that nature. And so um, there's, a real, there's, a, there's a real need for transparency and, an, and a capitalist instinct against transparency, right? And so I think that those two things are kind of at war. Um, I'm gonna say like, kind of maybe ridiculous statement that we will, we will probably maybe never be able to achieve, but I think we need to decouple access to information from capitalism. I don't know how we're doing that, right? <laughs> but I think that that's the heart of, of a lot of the problems is that all of our tools are made to maximize profit instead of made to maximize access to information or transparency or connecting humans, right? Like it's true, Facebook was supposed to be about connecting humans, but no, it's a company making people a lot of money selling all of us, right? Like that's, that's what it's really, doing and we were obscuring that for a long time. Um, so I don't have a solution to that, but I think the transparency is, is a good way to at least start, or if we can't get the transparency, at least thinking about communicating with the communities that we're trying to reach out to to get buy-in from them about how they're going to be used, um, and I don't say used with like a derogatory thing, but just what's the, what is AI doing for them, right? Like that they can see the concrete sort of um, benefit to them rather than feeling like this is just another instance where people are gonna come in with promise but take from us, right? Um, I feel a little bit like we need to address kind of the distrust that is around maybe some of these systems. Um, and I think like the idea of transparency is a really good idea, um, but that until we get until we address that distrust, I think it's like a long road to get the sort of AI that we want because you're gonna have a lot of fights over the data training sets and things of that nature. Right, and do you have any examples from your experience where um, a AI could be an enabler for people to enjoy culture as a public good? And examples where it could be a hindrance? So I think that you see both possibilities of the future. So how do we make sure that AI enables copyright system or the capitalist society in which we live in. So is there a potential for AI to, to change all of this? I think even with the technology we have right now, we can make some really cool tools. Like imagine you have a scan of crewings and you want to get the sense of what it looks like. Like that's a fantastic application for generative AI. On the other hand, because of how it's trained right now, uh, like AI, I mentioned that to some people yesterday, is an average machine. The way it's trained, because there's this instinct for anyone who's going to want to build a good system to get all of this 
data that they have access to without thinking about what bias did it have and what they're going to forget. Um, you're going to have a reconstruction probably of your ruins that correspond to common current cultural beliefs about how things work at the past, right? You're going to put some very strong bias. Mm. So it's both something that can be fantastic and something that's going to move us further away from, in this case, doing good science or doing good historical way in a way that's very subtle and that I think we need to better understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think, I think AI as a tool is basically neutral, right? It's just how we use it. And I think that, yeah, I can see many ways that it could enable fantastic access to things that we can't do otherwise. Um, it already has helped us, right? Like developing these kinds of systems. Um, so yeah, I feel like I said a lot of negative things and I don't wanna say like, I totally see that this could be a really useful tool. But I think it's up to us and not the AI systems at this point, right? Like what we do with them, so. I mean, it's a great point. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the fact that we definitely have a long way to go in terms of bias and discrimination. There's amazing work that people have been doing already for a long time. And I wanna lift up uh, in particularly, like there are women and people of color in the United States who've been working on algorithmic accountability long before this current wave of AI hype um, in terms of trying to think about through those difficult problems that we're going to have to contend with in terms of making sure these tools are really equitable and good for um, it being something that cuts across cultures. And at the same time, I do want to get excited about the potential for some of the things that this technology promises for us. I mean, looking at even something as what seems simple now to people as like language translation that has seen huge leaps and bounds forward thanks to AI technology is a pretty amazing thing if you take a few steps back and think about how close we are uh, getting to a really robust the ability to do like Star Trek style universal translator um, on demand, uh, very inexpensive language translation work is just a huge potential game changer for society, for shared global culture, for things like that. So I think there's a lot to get excited about and we should stay excited even while um, acknowledging that there's a lot of work to do um, and we should look to people that have been thinking about how to do that work uh, for a long time in terms of embracing solutions uh, that people are already thinking about. I think maybe something else I will add is uh, one of the most damaging trends we have in AI is this idea of like one model to rule them all, one model to do everything, uh, or using generative AI because it's impressive to do some of things, lots of things that need reliability. Uh, there's so much we can get by making it easy for someone who has a data set and knows what their inputs and outputs is to build an AI system. Uh, that's not going to be, like the most efficient way to be is not going to take, again, large numbers of data entries and make it work for that. It's going to have maybe a bit of in-house competency, but not that much, and getting, sharing all of the work that other people have done for similar use cases. But I think keeping control of your data, keeping control of your use case, and keeping control of how you're applying your AI system. <laughs> I, probably all the good things happened while I was in law school. Um, it, it made my education of dubious like value as soon as I graduated, since it was dated. But yes. Um, no, the reason that I'm saying this is that Creative Commons uh, is at the foundation of this open infrastructure that enables open sharing today, and um, our licenses are essential to that scaffolding for these exchanges of culture and knowledge and information to have it on the open web. And I wonder if you see a role for um, generative AI here to, to help realize not only access, um, use and remix and all the great things that you know the early days of the internet uh, promised us, but that it can sustain this infrastructure that is at risk um, because of all these other models that are um, you know threatening the way that we want to see uh, public infrastructure flourish. So I wonder if you have come across some examples of uh, AI being able to not only provide that access, but also really support in a sustainable way <coughs> the essential infrastructure for all of these exchanges to be possible. Um, 
Yeah, I'd love to, yeah, love to weigh in on. So for, it, especially for thinking about our intellectual property system right now that we are dealing with in, in the face of this, what seems like a big change uh, to a lot of people, which is aggregating data together into data sets in order to do this training of models is, you know, sending people spinning in many ways in terms of grappling with how to do this. Um, and in terms of building the digital infrastructure to think about what we need to do with that, um, it's put up a lot of questions. I think it's so great that UC is here because talking about opt-outs and this, um, the responsible data practices um, is like a critical component of all of this. And I do hope that there will be this virtuous cycle that goes into AI models that are well-trained and responsibly designed that then are able to use and enable better infrastructure for doing the same thing. And so I'm thinking about things like helping people understand and pick CC licenses using AI, for example, would be like a great example of have, having people understand like the use cases for all of these different things. And that would be ways that you know, we could use this technology itself to help promote that infrastructure of global sharing. Um, that's a really exciting possibility. I think another thing that is worth getting excited about is that as people are seeing that there's a value in aggregated, shared cultural data and information, this is an opportunity to revitalize excitement in these original principles of openness and sharing and digital public infrastructure um, and getting people excited about the idea of maybe we should be looking at how we build things collectively and understanding that value of a public good again um, and this is an opportunity to do that. Instead of making a moment where we shrink away from that, we should be looking at it as a chance to engage people and show them that we can build things together that are way better than anything that we can build individually. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, so I, I think about projects like the Curationist Project that we've heard a lot about where helping people being able to search art better and more accurately, like, that's great. Um, I've heard people talking about trying to make it easier to figure out if something you want to use is in the public domain or what kind of Creative Commons licenses around it. That would also be really great. We have a lot of um, barriers that are set up when people can't figure out the copyright status of things. And so it would be wonderful if we could use AI to help us figure that out better. Um, but I think along the lines of um, what has been said, actually by both of you, that it's the AI is, is as good as its data set and what its training materials are and that we really do need to reach out and, and there's a tension between um, you wanna have the best data set that you can get for the training materials but also not wanting to steal people's stuff to make your training materials, right? And so balancing how, how, can, we op how can we maximize how much we have for the training materials and I think a lot of that is, is outreach. Um, but I think, I think Amanda brought up on the first panel also though, thinking about taking things out of their original intended audience is something to, to really consider. Um, that um, I work with fan creators and our data got scraped. I think it was Abby who said, if your data's out there, it's, it's been scraped and put into AI. Yeah, ours is out there. Um, and we had a big outcry about it. And a lot of them felt very personally victimized because this was work that they had put up and yes it's a public community and we talk to our users all the time about like it's on the internet it's public but they felt it was part of a community that understood the context of it that lifted it up that celebrated it that supported their creativity and now it's been removed and taken into a context that they feel they've lost all control and they don't know how it's what's going to happen to it next right and the truth is they always had no control because they had it on the internet right but but, but it's just a way of thinking about there are some corners of the internet that still feel very isolated and niche, even in the internet, not even talking about like real life. And when you're just crawling all corners of the internet and bringing it into a centralized place, that's something to think about too, is that you're removing things from context maybe, removing things from the audience it was intended for, and we should, I know why we're doing that. We want the best data sets, data sets but it, it causes like that lack of trust that then you don't get the buy-in and then you get worse and worse because then people start locking up their stuff and you get worse and worse and it becomes a snowball effect, right? So just something to, to think about as we think of the awesome things that we can do with AI. I, I really wanted to jump on that because it brings together, uh, also someone mentioned like something in the pre previous panel, uh, some of the limits of where AI is pushing uh, copyright and some of the biases. Um, where AI, I think, is stretching a lot of how we think about those questions 
questions is by that level of generalization, right? Like people will go make a data set. You might have an inline for the data set. They just might be making a data set. And then people use it for a specific purpose. And then we have this breaking point where like there's liability for the person making the data set that maybe didn't do anything wrong with respect to, it, to what the originator wanted. But then who's responsible when someone else does it, right? Because they've already publicly tested it. Uh, one anecdote that I really like sharing is like a year ago, I did an hour and a half session on data governance with teenagers um, and who had a lot more to say about it than some of my colleagues. <laughs> um, but the responses were extremely gendered, right? Like the question is like, if you put something in the internet, is it free for anyone to use? And I have to say that a lot of the boys were saying, yes, of course, like you did it, like now it's your problem. And a lot of the girls were like, no, I put it like for that purpose and to share with my friends. Uh, so that's really aligned with some of the ways that telling people, yeah, of course everybody agrees that it's free to use, that it's fair use with a very, very rough definition of fair use, uh, tends to be because like the people developing are necessarily the most diverse crew and their intuition will align with some of those people. To be a bit more specific, I think uh, there's a lot we need to figure out in terms of licensing that allows for openness but still has purpose encoded in it and recognize what that data is and obviously like Creative Commons is one of the organizations that started formalizing that a lot. Um, I was making another point but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, a lot of new ideas. I think uh, I wanna thank you for sharing your vision uh, and, and also sharing a few like very concrete ideas on why that could be super helpful to make sure that um, everyone can enjoy it. I'll share the public good. Um, I want to open the floor for questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, microphone is in the air. Hi, thank you so much for the conversation. Um, I have a question um, that's on the side of, so if we think of AI and culture as a public good, there's a governance conversation that's really important also about the governance of AI. So it's not just you know, the question of um, um, <clears throat> how can AI help us enjoy culture, but it's also how can we govern AI such that we can have the culture uh, that we want. Um, and I'm curious to hear about um, any thoughts you have on lessons from thinking about data governance, from thinking about commons governance and other aspects of digital public infrastructure for this moment where the conversation about generative AI governance is taking a specific shape. I'm thinking among other things about this strange new conversation about red teaming as a public oversight thing, um, but also like specifically like inviting like you know, here are some lessons from hard thinking and spending years thinking about licensing, thinking about public public interest and you know like well governed public interest projects in this space. Here are some lessons for this strange new oversight conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Anyone wants to jump in? Can we have governance? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, one area where I think we can take some concrete lessons on this from actually comes from other areas of telecom uh, where there have been things like public interest regulatory standards for, for a long time. There were public interest requirements and still are public interest requirements for broadcasters in the United States. There have been different kinds of public interest requirements for cable operators. Um, and it's worth thinking about what those, how those kinds of regulatory structures could exist for AI companies. I think it's also worth thinking about the possibility that it's not a, a done deal that AI must be the domain purely of private actors, that there is room for public institutions still to get in on this technology and we should think about if it is really such a critical piece of the digital public infrastructure going forward, what role the public sector plays in developing AI and playing into the ecosystem in big or small ways in order to ensure that we have that governance that is built into our systems of government already directly involved in, in the system. And that would be a way to ensure that we're protecting our values. Um, a really small example of this, but I think an impactful one, is that the United States is thinking about creating a national AI research resource, which would extend uh, United States' like, uh, public resource pools in terms of computing and access to uh, different resources to public institutions to do research and, and what they're building into that process is a preference for projects that address 
issues like civil rights, issues like bias and discrimination, issues in terms of how to address accountability and oversight in AI, and building those things into the structure of how you even do the funding of research is a valuable way to like build in the principles and values that we care about in our governance directly into the AI ecosystem. We, we need to think more about ways that we can do things like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, think, I think I've never, I've never seen it done perfectly. And I think that's because it's really difficult to do. And so I think first of all, um, we don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Like if it's good enough, let's do it, right? Like let's just make a move, let's just not. Um, but at the same time, that's scary because you don't want to make the wrong move, right? And I do think that I want the government to, to be involved. I want it to, if this is a public good, then the government is in theory our steward of public goods. Like that's supposed to be what the government is doing. And so the government should be involved but I also think we, we really need to balance the government with also the private interests, which I know I've been like fighting against capitalism, but I think that, um, I, I think back to like how long it took cable competition to happen, right? The government was like, no, 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 like the phone companies can't be competing on cable. We can all, and they like stood in the way for a really, really, really long time. Then they got out of the way and all of a sudden we had all this movement on, on, on cable prices and all this. And so it's like, I don't want to have, like, this is why I say it's difficult to do well. Like you have to hit this like weird middle of the road balance, which is hard for humans to do. We're just really hard at maintaining balance just always. Like I just use that word and you're thinking in your head right now about a thing you're out of balance with in your life, right? Like it's really hard for humans to do that. And so you just always have to be, you're going to be tipped one way or the other and you just got to keep doing, you know, adjusting, I think, as you go along. I think like as a machine learning person, a bit more humility from machine learning people. Um, if you talk to anyone who has been working on security for the last few decades and who are like, this is not what human being means, like we have studied how to make things safe and secure, please don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, we can do a bit more like multidisciplinary practices there. because as you, as you said, this is gonna be a multi-pronged approach. And I think the reflex so far has been to look at copyright as the governance model mm -hmm. and ex almost exclusively copyright. And um, when you think copyright and openness and regulating access and freedom of choice, well, Creative Commons uh, comes to mind. And so we've been asked a lot, like could Creative Commons build that new governance model around access to works uh, to train AI about around uh, you know, defining the copyright status of AI output. But I wanna say that copyright is only one lens to look at these issues and it's a very blunt tool. So it's, um, it doesn't really get to the subtle nuances that we need to regulate this properly. So I think it's really important that we take a step back and look at all the other concerns that fall really outside the scope of copyright and throw them into the mix of the governance model that we wanna build. So, you know, we need a, a social net for, for artists. We need, um, you know, an ethical framework that goes beyond the rules of copyright because we wanna make sure that these decisions are good and not evil, right? That's the, the basic principles of ethics. And we also wanna foster community norms. We wanna see how the community can sort these issues through practice and through experience. And at Creative Commons, it's really important that our, society, uh, our community can come together and discuss and find solutions to these issues so that we can have a governance system that reflects the true problems that they're facing on the ground. So I think this multi-pronged approach is central and thank you for, for that question. Another question. Thank you very much, the whole panel. Um, I'm a, this question is mainly for Stacey, but uh, for kind of everyone. And, but I wanna start off by saying, like, I think some people who are, like, I, I'm talking here as a fandom person, right? Mm -hmm. As well as various other things. And I think people don't, who are outside that kind of fandom don't really get quite how radical it is. Because, mm -hmm. um, Places like Archive of Our Own, as a response to media that is, that is produced for public consumption, are, to my mind, one of the, one of the purest examples of counterculture that's ever come out of the internet. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it still exists. It's, it is literally counterculture. And the copyright architecture of that is, is central to how that community and that culture is fostered. And obviously, fandom existed, fan fiction existed way before the internet. People would uh, like talk to people who were just you know photocopying and stapling zines of their <laughs> Kirk Spock fanfic and would go to conventions to you know to exchange these in the 70s but the internet made that a community and a culture in a completely different way that was and remains radical like as a British person who is non-binary like I'm like, I kind of want to have a t-shirt that says like JK Rowling doesn't I, I, I JK Rowling doesn't have the rights to any of this <laughs> you know but like um, but my question is like I'd just love the panel to think about what kind of countercultural opportunities, genuinely countercultural opportunities, we might not be seeing um, with with the with the rise of generative AI, because I think it's like nobody nobody predicted that happening with fandom, and people really didn't notice it outside that culture. So, like that's the question: Can we imagine anything like that? Yeah, M maybe not right now. And and when you when you think about it, and you think about the history of fandom, like there's always been groups of people who have been pushing it forward against a lot of um, resistance, right? And the success of AO3 and OT Double, which honestly is rocky all the time. I'm on the legal committee. It's, it's, always, it's always an uphill battle over there. But their work, it was very carefully cultivated to, to encourage this sort of counterculture that didn't have a place to grow. It wasn't being nurtured, right? It was kind of just like always, uh, even on the internet, didn't have a space for it to be safe, was always getting thrown off of places, right? And so you're right that, that those things happen, but if you allow them space to grow, they happen better, right? They happen in better ways. And it's funny that you said that, because as we were sitting up here, one of the points that I actually wrote down um, in my remarks is we keep talking about culture, like it's this like behemoth thing, and we all agree on what the culture is. And actually, we all belong to many myriad tiny cultures, right? Like. And you talk about fandom, and I can stand up here and talk about fandom, and I bet you that if we were in like a fan convention together, we might not even overlap, because within fandom, there's like a million other different tiny cultures, right? And so, um, yeah, I think, and I think that that is part of the fan reaction against, um, and I fans don't all speak with one voice, they just said it's like very plethora of communities, but there was a lot of outcry against their works being used for a data set for a chat GPT. And I do think that part of that was we feel like a culture that has been maligned and belittled and mocked and we found a place where we can grow and now you're just gonna steal it and bring us right back to the, to the bigger culture and flatten us out, right? That at the end, what we end up with is like a flatter version of culture. I don't know if that's like what's going to happen, but I do think that just, just, just talking about culture, I think opens the question of like, what culture, whose culture, what are we talking about here in the first place, so yeah. Having this idea that people can keep building their own AI system, controlling the whole development chain, and having the power to decide what's going to come in at each of those stages, I think it's necessary to leave room for those projects to emerge within AI as well. I was gonna say, I, I literally wrote down Wikipedia as my, <laughs> one, my one example of something I thought turned out better than I thought it was going to turn out. And it, and it gives me like, I literally wrote it down, like it gives me so much hope. Like in the early days, everyone was like, don't go to Wikipedia, it's the only place on the internet I trust now, right? I'm like, people are actually like figuring out what's going on in Wikipedia, so yeah. Um, I'll just say really quick, I think one of the counterculture opportunities that exists with AI goes, goes towards what I was talking about in terms of both how AI could promote like a culture of openness and sharing again in terms of people seeing the collective benefit, but also a countercultural thing that could exist and is very related to fandom is this idea of people really coming to terms with the fact that all culture is built on other culture, which has always been a core element of the whole sharing and openness community, but AI is maybe like laying bare some of this in a really radical way for people that they're seeing that you know culture and creativity is built on other culture and creativity. 
And um, there's a real counterculture opportunity there to really engage with that idea and pull it to the forefront and stop pretending like stuff just uh, springs out of people's heads or more accurately like movie studios fully formed. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you to the panelists. I think we laid the foundation for more conversations in the following panel. Thank you for your contributions.